During the interview, they had been secretive about their business, and I did not really know what they did. Though, they did tell me their clients spanned about 50 countries. It was 2012, I was 21, about to be a senior in college, and had never had an internship. I had selected international business as my major without much serious thought. Indeed, I remember saying, I just want a job that pays me to travel all the time. A few days after the interview, I had my first internship. The company had about 25 people in it and was headquartered in California with a satellite office in Vermont, where I was. About a month into the job, my manager approached me in the office. Can you fly to Texas in three hours? <laughs> I thought for a minute before saying I could go, not asking what was in Texas or why I, out of all the other people in the office, was the person being asked to go on such short notice. I went home, packed my bags, then flew down that day. I met two of my coworkers in Houston and found out we would be packaging a large number of <laughs> lithium batteries used by the oil industry. And this is what the company actually did. I ended up going to Texas a lot that summer packaging batteries. That October, still as an intern, I was asked to travel to Kuwait for two weeks to help my coworker package more batteries. I felt like such a cool guy asking my professors if I could take off class to go to the Middle East for a business trip. <laughs> it did not occur to me to ask why they were sending a 21-year-old intern being paid $12 an hour to go do this. <laughs> Through training, I came to find out these batteries were actually pretty dangerous. The reason a specialized consulting company needed to assist with packaging was because the batteries contained reactive chemicals that had the potential to do all kinds of fun things like <laughs> <laughs> vent hydrochloric acid at high pressure, explode, creating a cloud of toxic and corrosive gas and shrapnel, or partially explode, <laughs> creating a projectile with enough force to break through metal walls or penetrate a person's body. These explosions, when they did happen, had the destructive force of a stick of dynamite. To tell you the truth, I cared a lot about being cool. I had not been a popular person growing up, and probably was trying to make up for that in college. Having a job that paid me to travel internationally made me feel so interesting and important. And after a few trips, the last thing I wanted was a corporate desk job. Indeed, I feared being stuck at a desk more than a battery exploding in my hand. I ended up being promoted before I even graduated, and I started traveling a lot. It was not unusual to be notified about traveling somewhere less than three days in advance. The international jobs generally consisted of me flying, mostly by myself, to developing countries, typically dangerous ones, where I would arrive on site, go into dilapidated warehouses on oil bases in remote areas of these countries, pull out drums of batteries that hadn't been moved in years, open them up and package the contents inside, whatever they ended up being, then travel back with little to no free time to actually see the country. These batteries were often so damaged to the point of looking closer to cat poop or bacon someone had been cooking and forgot about. These batteries had to be shipped via ocean freight because no airline was willing to put them in a cargo aircraft. Going to places like Port Harcourt, Nigeria, with its high kidnapping rates. I was transported by armed convoy, and likely the only person in the country actually qualified <laughs> enough to do the work. My parents were obviously thrilled about my first job out of college. The CEO, Aaron, was one of the wealthiest people I had met in my life. He was about 50 and extremely charismatic. He claimed to only sleep for two to four hours each day. The man often made wildly inappropriate jokes in meetings. I remember sitting in a meeting, talking about a project that was behind schedule, when Aaron said, what's the holdup here? A small retarded child could have completed this project in 30 hours. We're sitting in another meeting, where he referred to Burlington, Vermont as being like a sphincter. Apparently, because it's difficult to get in and out of. <laughs> it was not unusual to have a two-hour meeting where Aaron would speak almost the entire time. 
Aaron lied a lot and would omit details from stories to get people to agree with him. Now, I'm not qualified to make a clinical diagnosis, <laughs> but the guy probably had narcissistic personality disorder. I watched time and time again as clients, newer employees, and others completely believe what Aaron would say is fact, even though I knew what he was saying to either be patently untrue or such a distorted version of reality that it may as well have been false. I watched managers who knew he was lying agree with him, or at least act like they did, and I felt gross watching this happen. It really made me understand how people like Jim Jones and Charles Manson came to achieve the followings that they did. <laughs> Despite clearly seeing red flags, I grew to idolize Aaron's behavior in ways and thought this arrogant approach to business was the key to reaching that level of success. Making a lot of money, seeming smart, and having unique things to talk about was so important to me and ironically, probably made me seem less cool to people. Even when Aaron would criticize me or send me an email in all capital letters, I was quick to forgive a lot of this if he complimented me, gave me a large bonus, or picked me to go on a trip to a fun city. No doubt about it, psychologically speaking, the term for this is intermittent reinforcement. <laughs> Besides that, it was just hard to think about walking away from all the perks. I was promoted three times to a senior management level, went to 22 countries, and I did sometimes do fun stuff, like swim in an infinity pool in Singapore, stand on top of the world's tallest building in Dubai, and go sketchily mountain climbing in Norway, <laughs> all before I was 25. About two years in, I asked to move to their California office near LA, and they authorized it. <laughs> they even gave me my own office there. I thought I was such hot shit, but retrospectively, I can't pretend getting promoted so many times or getting all these perks was not usually the direct result of somebody else quitting. Aaron liked nicknaming people without their consent and did this to my coworker, Florence. After she told us her brother Lawrence's nickname was Larry, Aaron decided it would be funny to nickname her Flarry. <laughs> he also did this to another coworker named Benjamin Isaac Ball or Benjamin I Ball. And Aaron had quickly nicknamed him Benny Eyeballs without asking Ben how he felt about it. Anyway, one time Ben and I were in Egypt when a triple bombing happened in the city we were in. Ben asked management if we should postpone traveling ar around the city for one day, and they said no. I met Aaron in the United Arab Emirates a few days later, and the first thing he said to me was, huh, wow, Ben was being a real pussy over there in Egypt, huh? <laughs> Some months later, Ben had a nervous breakdown at the airport and quit, and I had to travel to Kuwait with four hours notice by myself to do his project. Aaron told the client that Ben was showing symptoms of the Ebola virus, and the airline had barred him from getting on the plane. <laughs> okay. I remember another time when I was robbed in Mexico, and I lost $4,000 worth of company property. When Aaron found out, he told me that not only was it my fault, but that I fucked the company and would have to sit next to him while he fired four people due to losing the client. He never fired anyone, and we never lost the client. The client never even found out. After this episode, Aaron made a point to tell me that he could fire everyone in the company without thinking twice and, I'm quoting, take my $100 million and ride off into the sunset. <laughs> I witnessed no less than 15 people quit, at least three of which were from nervous breakdowns leading to unplanned midday rage quits, as we came to call them. I watched the company's glass door rating rapidly plummet to a whopping one star with inspiring reviews such as, I wouldn't wish this job on my worst enemy, verbally abusive work environment, and inarguably the worst place I have ever worked. Aaron ended up making another Glassdoor profile for a fictitious second company with a similar name and posted a number of fake reviews on it to try and trick people into thinking it was a nice place to work. <laughs> I noticed myself thinking things like, man, I hope Alex who just quit doesn't shoot up the office tomorrow. <laughs> I felt unsettled by that and then I realized why Aaron had two separate locked doors that you had to go through to enter the office. 
As I moved up in the company, I found myself lying a lot to clients and manipulating people, and I did not like who I was becoming. After an explosion almost happened while I was on a solo project, I realized none of this was worth my safety, and I had to find a new job. I was 26, it was the winter of 2016, and I was working remotely in a small office in Point Loma with no windows by myself. I applied to jobs like a madman, applying for about 70 in total. After four months of job hunting, and in my haste to get out, I accepted a corporate biotech job that involved working at a desk, full time. I don't work there anymore, but that's a story for another vamp. <laughs> I'm sure you can imagine the fun conversations I had with Aaron as he tried to convince me not to leave the company with the conversation eventually culminating into unforgettable quips such as, if I ever see you again in the business world, I will fuck you. <laughs> Believe it or not, I do have empathy. <laughs> and you're gonna do some mental gymnastics to make this okay in your mind, and you'll tell people I'm the bad guy just because I threatened you on the phone just now. Miraculously, I was never injured, and nothing permanently bad actually happened to me. Eight other people quit shortly after I did. In total, I worked there for five years. This experience fundamentally changed the way I view people and business. I realized perks only go so far when you're dealing with people that don't care about you or your safety. And people like Aaron rarely change. But would I have been happier sitting at some desk in an office for those five years? Probably not, honestly. There's no question that was a toxic place, though. And people working there still text me to tell me how awful it is. So, was it worth it? Hard to say. I got screamed at a lot, manipulated, and almost died a few times. But, on the other hand, I reached a six-figure net worth by age 24. I've been to every continent and I nonchalantly visited the Eiffel Tower on a layover in Paris. So, I guess, you be the judge. What would you have done? <laughs>